It remains one of the greatest conspiracy theories of all time. Born in an era of global political suspicion, did the Apollo astronauts really land on the moon? They had to fake the moon landings because they knew successful trips to the moon and returns could not be made. They were producing a production, a showpiece, if you will. Those close to the missions have nothing but contempt for the skeptics. Their ignorance of science is so complete that it's pointless to try and argue with them. These hoax conspiracy propagators are doing a tremendous disservice to the young people of our future. Any idea could have been hoaxed is, quite frankly, insane. To test the evidence underpinning the hoax theories, we've built our own moon set. Were the Apollo moon landings really a giant leap for mankind, as claimed, or just a small step for man? In the 21st century, one of our greatest achievements continues to fuel controversy. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. But were the Apollo moon landings the culmination of a carefully orchestrated hoax? Bill Kazing is often called the father of moon conspiracy theorists. When Armstrong said that's one small step for man and one giant leap for mankind, I think that the footprint that he was leaving was in Area 51, north of Las Vegas, Nevada. The second man on the moon, close behind Armstrong, was Edwin Buzz Aldrin. I'm uh, totally in favor of freedom of speech. But I think uh, people need to be responsible when they think about intentionally, for their own benefit, misleading the young people who are the future leaders of our world. Though the hardcore of dedicated conspiracy theorists is small, their ideas have, over the past three decades, found a wide and appreciative audience. One in five Americans are believed now to entertain doubts. And you hear about uh, the fact that the landing was actually done in a television studio. And there was the big black background, like, you know, fake stars and stuff. It's the flag being planted on the moon facing one way and the shadow of the man being the other way. I mean, I've heard that maybe the terrain that was seen on the video wasn't accurate, the walking wasn't accurate. There are no stars in some of the photographs and that there should be because there was no atmosphere and that the stars would shine so brightly. If the Apollo missions were faked, NASA would have created a conspiracy of monumental proportions. Forty years ago, the Cold War locked the USA in an ideological struggle with the Soviet Union. On October the 4th, 1957, the Soviets launched Sputnik, the world's first satellite. It was a coup for communism. The breakthrough hit America right where it hurt, in the heart of high technology. Sputnik shocked a lot of people uh, in this country, and I think the president uh, was looking for a way to respond to this, and uh, at the advice of a number of people, he chose uh, an objective that he felt uh, for sure we could uh, be first. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. At the peak of the Apollo program, NASA employed 400,000 people. If the moon landings were faked, thousands of scientists and technicians were either duped along with the rest of us, or they've been extraordinarily good at keeping a secret all these years. It was a giant step for mankind. Uh, we, we moved from people dreaming about uh, whether people could get into space and uh, we went ahead in a very short time, so it was a very momentous achievement. July the 16th, 1969, the astronauts prepare for takeoff. While the world waited for history to be made, there was already one man who had his doubts.
During the 1960s, Bill Kazing was head of technical publications for Rocketdyne, a company involved in the manufacture of the Apollo rockets. This gave him access to top secret documents. What he read led him to question the feasibility of the whole moon project. He claims the CIA had made three attempts on his life to silence his controversial views. Today, he keeps a low profile, living on a cat sanctuary in the Nevada desert. I really believe that they weren't in the command capsule at launch. They, uh, they did a little bit of a magician act with the astronauts. They went up the elevator, but they came down the elevator. In other words, they did not want to risk the lives of the astronauts in case the Saturn blew up. Like Bill Kazing, Ralph René, a self-taught engineer and author, believes that the technology of the day simply wasn't up to the task. There is absolutely no way they went to the moon with what they had. In fact, there's no way they can go today. There's no way they can go tomorrow. You don't send man where you haven't sent the monkey. Nevertheless, the president had promised a man on the moon by 1970. If NASA couldn't do it, they'd have to fake it with foolproof documentary evidence. Marcus Allen is the British publisher of Nexus, a magazine dedicated to alternative politics, history, and science. Those photographs can be demonstrated not to have been taken on the lunar surface. Now, if they were not taken on the lunar surface, there's only one other place they could have been taken, and that's on Earth. Documentary evidence from all six of the successful Apollo landings shows similar anomalies. In some, areas lit from behind, which should be in deep shadow, are bright and perfectly visible. In other pictures, the shadows are at near right angles, suggesting two separate light sources. Perhaps most surprisingly, there are no stars in the Apollo photographs, even though they were taken from space. When the archive film is sped up, the astronauts appear to be running at normal speed in terrestrial gravity. And why does the flag appear to be fluttering in a breeze, even though there's no wind on the moon? To test whether any of these allegations can be substantiated, we plan to create our own lunar set. Its location, the Trona Pinnacles, a desert area four hours from Hollywood, home of illusion. Our moon set will be used as a backdrop, not to try and fake our own lunar landings, but to test the most famous hoax theories. We've brought in historically accurate props to recreate the iconic moments. A single high wattage studio lamp will replicate the intensity of the sun as our sole light source. By challenging some of the most famous conspiracy arguments, can our experiments prove whether the small step for mankind was really the giant leap they said it was? In 1969, the general public had little reason to doubt the evidence of its own eyes. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin had returned triumphant. Their achievement was a celebration of supremacy. America had won the space race. Ian Morrison witnessed the Apollo 11 mission from an exclusively privileged perspective. At the time, he was a student at the Jodrell Bank Radio Telescope near Manchester. The telescope's radio tracking device allowed him to eavesdrop on the astronaut's conversation, but it also meant that he could follow the every move of the landing module, the Eagle, as it prepared to land on the lunar surface. I should say that we were not officially tracking the Apollo craft. Uh, we were doing this for fun, our own fun and our own interest. T minus 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence start. We could hear the whole conversation of the astronauts all the way down to the surface. They were obviously highly excited, and it must have been wonderful as they sort of literally reached the surface. Two, one. Zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. 
Astronomer Sir Patrick Moore reported the mission live on British television. Ever since the dawn of human history, we dreamed about going to other worlds, and this was the first time it had been done. And of course, it was an exciting time, and also a very tense one. And of course, I knew both Neil and Buzz. And of course, there was no provision for rescue. Had they made a faulty landing, they couldn't have got back, and that would have been too ghastly to contemplate. But the skeptics claimed NASA faced an uphill struggle. They could not guarantee success with the apparently primitive technology of the 1960s. This was brought into sharp focus just 14 months before the mission, when Neil Armstrong test piloted a prototype landing module. Unfortunately, it went out of his control, and luckily he was able to eject before it crashed in flames. And of course, the point is, if they couldn't get a simulator to work on Earth, how in the world could they get the actual lunar module to work on the moon? The conspiracy theorists not only question the technical capabilities of the landing craft, but also the computing power that guided it. The processing power of the Apollo 11 spacecraft has been likened to that of a pocket calculator. Jim Oberg is a former space shuttle engineer. He was commissioned by NASA to write a book denying the conspiracy claims. Although it was pulled by NASA, Oberg stayed on the case. It's pretty amazing to realize there's probably more computer technology here in an automobile than in the Apollo spacecraft. But as Jim points out, it's the way you use it that counts. The Apollo computers, spacecraft computers in those days, spoke pretty much numeric language. Unlike modern day PCs, the Apollo computers didn't have to store files or process graphics. They were dedicated number crunchers transmitting information from the mainframe computers on Earth to the astronauts in space. But it was still a very simple computer, and yet the exact tasks needed were well defined and well understood. The computer couldn't do a whole lot more, but it, it was able to do enough. For Apollo. At Jodrell Bank, Ian Morrison could chart the crucial last minutes of the computer guided Eagle as it prepared to land. We had some equipment here that could literally measure the acceleration or de acceleration of the spacecraft as it slowed down towards the surface. And it's shown here graphically, and this is literally just a copy of the original graph that we have. And what you see here is a very nice smooth curve. The fact it's becoming more gentle means that the spacecraft was gently coming down to land under computer control. 60 seconds. Ice on. But the interesting thing is that just before it looked as though it was going to land, the graph changed. And instead of going down, the, the craft accelerated upwards. As we uh, were at 500 feet and uh, Neil Armstrong took over the, the controls, uh, manually to, to redirect it because he could see that uh, we were headed for a place that didn't look too suitable and he wanted to fly over it on the other side. Roger, 1201 alarm. Roger, we got you. We're going at alarm. Neil Armstrong realized the automatic pilot was taking him straight down into a crater. He lifted the lamb up and you can see this quite little bump here as he accelerated up from the surface. And then you see this rather wiggly bit as he basically flew over the surface beyond the crater and finally brought the LEM to land. Contact light. OK, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. And then Neil's voice came through. The Eagle has landed. And that, to me, was a minute of intense relief. And since I'm on the air live, I had to watch what I said. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. But man's first foray on the moon is the epicenter of the hoax theories. In an attempt to disprove the missions, the conspiracy theorists have analyzed every frame with a fine-toothed comb. Buzz Aldrin's dance across the moonscape has become one of the most celebrated moments in history. Near the end of the two and a half hours, 
uh, in front of the television camera, I did have an opportunity to, to prance around and, and hop and, and demonstrate different uh, methods of, of moving around. The movement, because of the restrictions of the spacesuit, was basically like being in slow motion. The skeptics claim that far from being like slow motion, this really was slow motion, recorded in a studio and broadcast at half speed. Speed up Buzz, and he appears to be running, albeit clumsily, in terrestrial gravity. Back on our moon set, our astronaut is wearing an accurate replica of an Apollo 11 suit. If the conspiracy theorists are right, by slowing him down, we should be able to recreate Buzz's famous moonwalk. The ungainly lope looks half right, but our astronaut still can't achieve the characteristic bounce and weightless grace of Buzz's original. NASA faced its own challenges trying to prepare the astronauts for life in space. Well, there were a lot of different schemes uh, of, of suspending a person and taking up one-sixth of his weight by, by pulleys or, or uh, working on a sort of a slanted uh, platform. NASA's other favorite method was parabolic flight, lovingly known by the astronauts as the vomit comet. By climbing and diving in a series of arcs, the plane can simulate 30-second bursts of reduced gravity. This gave astronauts a feel for the ups and downs of life in space, but the suggestion that an entire lunar landscape could have been built inside the aircraft stretches credibility well beyond breaking point. For the skeptics, refuting the moonwalk theory means nothing. They claim they have all the proof they need in the photographs. I do not think it was feasible for the astronauts to take the wonderful pictures that NASA has presented as having been taken on the moon. There are so many impediments that uh, were uh, natural. The fact that they wore gloves that couldn't uh, be manipulated, the fact that they didn't have any sources of light, any flash. Ralph René also believes the design of the Apollo suits would have prevented the astronauts operating anything as delicate as a camera. To prove the point, he's designed a space glove machine, which is supposed to replicate the effects of space on the body. In the near vacuum of space, the gases within his body would immediately expand. And what I do is I pull a vacuum in this chamber I created, and I have a glove inserted inside of it, and it was to prove that the flexibility they shown in their suits and gloves are impossible. Well, right now, I can put my hand in there and I can move it every which way. I can grasp, I make a fist, I can lift up, down. But as soon as I throw this switch here, I evacuate the chamber. As the air is sucked out of the machine, the vacuum makes the glove increasingly difficult to flex. And this glove doesn't want to move. I can, can't bend it backwards. I can hardly force it down, and I, sh I can make a fist, but you can't hold it. And you could never pick, I mean, how could you pick up small screws and bolts like they've shown them to do, or trigger a little tiny trigger on a camera with the glove doing this? Trained aerospace engineer Jay Windley runs a website dedicated to repudiating the moon conspiracies. His passion and knowledge runs deep. For this program, he has agreed to challenge the most persistent conspiracy claims. This is a Hasselblad EL500 camera manufactured specially for the lunar missions. Yet attached to the spacesuit via this bayonet, the camera would have a framework surrounding the bottom and rear of the camera, and it would slide down onto the control unit here so that the astronaut could work with his hands without worrying about the camera. The lunar cameras didn't need a viewfinder. The restrictions of the helmet made it impossible for the astronauts to look down and frame a shot. Basically, you could just sort of point that camera at what you wanted without having to really look through a viewfinder. According to the conspiracy theorists, this was a major impediment. This is where the shutter is on the Hasselblad camera, which cannot be seen from inside the helmet 
the astronauts are wearing. So how do they know they've taken a photograph? How do they know the finger's even got onto the shutter? How do they know they pressed it? The shutter release, normally a very small button, has been made especially large so that it can be pressed with an astronaut's glove. Reinforced inner suits also helped the astronauts manipulate the camera, as did several other design features. The Zeiss Biogon lens here has been fitted with these little paddles to allow the astronaut to manipulate them with clumsy fingers. You just push it in either direction. The focus ring has been fitted with stops that correspond to near, medium, far, and infinity. So he didn't have to pay attention to whether he was eight feet or nine feet away from a subject. He wouldn't have to very carefully measure it. Richard Underwood was responsible for training the Apollo astronauts in the art of lunar photography. Even in the early days, before they went to the moon, I'd say, you know, when you get back uh, from this journey, you will be a national hero. But your photographs, I say, if they're good, they'll live forever. I tell them, your only key to immortality is the quality of your photography. Nothing else. Forget all the other stuff. The astronauts were told to take their lunar cameras everywhere and practice. They took them home to photograph their friends and family and barbecues and sporting events and all other types of things. They knew that camera uh, very, very effectively. Uh, so all of the crew members understood pretty well how to operate this. And the film uh, turned out to be very, very versatile in coming up with uh, just outstanding results. But even if you accept that photographs could physically have been taken on the moon, you're still left with the most famous of the apparent photographic anomalies, the shadows. The shadows are one of the strong proofs that we never went to the moon. If you examine pictures offered by NASA as genuine, you find that in many cases, the shadows are not parallel. Well, since the sun was the only source of light all shadows on the moon should be exactly parallel, but they aren't. The lunar shadows sometimes fall in different directions. The skeptics claim this as incontrovertible evidence of at least two light sources. There's only one sun. There are not two. But these shadows are anomalous in that sometimes they are diverging from objects and sometimes converging. And, and it can't be. You can go any place on this planet when the sun's up and you look at two objects and those sun shadows are parallel. Take up Ralph Rene's challenge and we can see shadows aren't always parallel. Shadows are a very poor way of determining the direction of the light source because they tend to diverge and converge based on the shape of the object that casts them and also because of the terrain that lies underneath them. These affect the direction of shadows as we see them. The conspiracy theorists can make that shadow go one direction or another, both literally and figuratively. And he can drive a wedge in the layman's uncertainty about them. The skeptics have also called into question areas that should be in shade, claiming a second light has been used to highlight areas that should have been a dense black. Well, let's have a look at one of the most famous photographs of the 20th century, Man on the Moon. It was taken by Neil Armstrong of Buzz Aldrin on Apollo 11. Given that it's very harsh light, as you can see here, where it strikes directly, you would expect the shadow area to be virtually invisible. But it's not. Yet on our moon set, we can see the single light source does not create heavy shade. As you can see, there is only one light source in this entire picture, and it's behind us. According to the conspiracy theorists, this side of the astronaut should be in total shadow. But it isn't. What's happening? The light from the ground around us is being reflected back up toward the astronaut, and it's illuminating this portion of him. The symbolic highlight of Apollo, the planting of the American flag, has also generated deep suspicion. Wherever there's an American flag, it's always brilliantly lit up, even if it's on the shadow side. And on the shadow side, that should be really dark black. But they had little spotlights, obviously, because that's the only way you can do it. Oh, geez, that's great. Is the lighting halfway decent? Conspiracy theorists say that it's suspicious for the flag to be brightly lit on both sides in all of the photographs. 
They say it should appear in shadow at some point. Here we can see our flag brightly lit from the front, but if we move around to the back, we can see that even with our single light source, it's still brightly lit. The light is shining through and making the flag glow. But this does not explain how a flag can wave in a windless environment. When they were filming some of the flag scenes, they had air conditioners going to keep the astronauts cooler since they were wearing their little uh, space suits. So it's very possible that what we saw was wind. Could the waving flag be a gaff too far? Conclusive proof that the landings were faked in a studio. On our moon set, Jay Windley hopes he can prove otherwise. The stars and stripes planted by the Apollo astronauts provides the conspiracy theorists with what they believe is a trump card. What I see is a flutter which is caused by variable wind pressures. So the picture could not have been taken on the moon no matter what the apologists say. Either that or the moon has a breeze. Despite their preparations on Earth, neither Neil Armstrong nor Buzz Aldrin quite knew what to expect as they prepared to raise the flag. Putting the flag on the moon was really a symbolic highlight of the mission. It was one that we had not really rehearsed. Uh, Neil knew where the flag was stowed. Uh, we brought it out, then we had to put the two pieces together. It won't go out. The astronauts had to drive the flagstaff into the hard lunar surface with a twisting motion. A horizontal aluminium rod kept the flag suspended. And this caused the free end of the flag to flip up and back in response to that. Also, this is an aluminum tube, very similar to the ones used on the Apollo mission. It's very springy. If I cause it to spring and then let go of it, we see that this motion continues long after I've let go of it. On Earth, this pendulum motion would be damped, in engineering terms, by air resistance. But on the moon, there is no air to slow the flag down and stop it waving. Most obvious evidence the flag was on the moon and not in any air is that whenever people walked by it, it didn't move at all. It only moved when someone was working with the staff or letting go as it rocked back and forth. It didn't billow like it was being hit by a burst of air. It swung back and forth like maybe a sheet of chain mail would. Try it yourself. Try this at home. But decreased gravity and the lack of atmosphere can't provide an explanation for the next apparent blunder. When the 16-ton eagle touched down, it should, claim the skeptics, have disturbed the surface of the moon, blowing the top layer of dust away to expose the rock beneath. But the images show footprints clearly imprinted around the base of the spacecraft. Surely the dust would have blown away, or worse. This enormously powerful jet of flame and heat and gas, it would have easily scooped up an enormous crater. In fact, there was supposition that the crater would have been so big that the lunar lander would have disappeared into it. <laughs> That's true. Ralph René has designed a simple experiment to illustrate the point. He's calculated that the landing module would have been approximately 26 times more powerful than a domestic leaf blower. And if a humble leaf blower can leave a crater in a gravel pit, the module with 10,000 pounds of thrust should have made a canyon. They didn't move dry dust. They didn't move little rocks. They didn't move anything. So the demonstration is to show that this stuff will disappear immediately, and I'll even be able to gouge some kind of a hole. Come here, you. I haven't used you in a long time. Here we go. According to Ralph Renee's experiment, the moon, like the gravel pit, wouldn't have stood a chance. When it actually landed, the dust was all still there. Now, how can that be? 
you know, if you blow dust away, it goes away, like I just did here. I swept the ground. But the eagle had reduced its power to 25% as it glided into land. Its gentle forward motion would have limited its impact on the ground even more. Under closer inspection, some of the photos do reveal that the landing disturbed the fine lunar soil, but not enough to blow away all surrounding dust. But the most intriguing anomaly has to be the absence of the largest, most stunning object seen in space. In a sky untouched by streetlights, atmosphere or pollution, the view of the night sky should be spectacular. But incredibly, stars appear to be missing from the Apollo photographs. Back then, fortunately for me and us, uh, who are trying to break this thing out the truth, they took no pictures of the stars. Bill Kazing believes that omitting the stars was all part of NASA's deception. Astronomers could have easily discerned that the, that the star positions were not those that would have appeared in a photograph taken from the moon. So it, it's another case where they could not fake it, so they simply ignored it. If you were to talk to Aldrin or Armstrong or any of the other uh, Apollo astronauts, they would actually not respond in any way to questions regarding stars. When you looked up at the sky, could you actually see the stars and the solar corona in spite of the glare? We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon by eye without looking through the optics. I asked Neil Armstrong whether he saw stars because I knew everybody else was asking. I knew the answer, of course. The point is that your eyes aren't adapted to that. The human eye reacts to light by closing and opening the iris. In bright light, the iris becomes smaller. In the dark, it widens. On the moon, the eye, like a camera aperture, cannot adjust to the brightness of the lunar surface and the dim light of a twinkling star at the same time. If you were to stand in a floodlit stadium or under a streetlight in a city, you would have the same effect. If you looked up, you wouldn't see many stars at all. Even a modern state-of-the-art TV camera can't cope with such extreme contrast. On our moon set, Jay Windley plans to put the whole matter to an exhaustive test and dispute the theory once and for all. We're going to find out that if we use an identical camera loaded with identical film and we shoot pictures of the night sky, we won't get stars. Okay, I'm going to take a shot here. You notice here I'm not using any sort of a viewfinder, I'm just aiming. With a replica Apollo Hasselblad, Jay took more than 24 photographs and repeated the experiment using a range of other cameras to test the hoax theories. The morning after, the negatives were developed at an independent processing laboratory in Los Angeles. In our experiment in the desert, we shot a variety of photographs using different film formats. In this 35 millimeter photograph, we see that the shadows of the crew members in our single light source very distinctly converge together. In fact, there's almost a 90 degree difference in, a, in the apparent shadow direction. In this photograph here, we see the effects of terrain on the shadows. The hills change the apparent direction of shadows. The astronaut's shadow here falls in one direction. The shadow of the crew falls in yet another direction because of the hill. These results directly contradict the conspiracy claims. Like the Apollo astronauts, we had to guess at our focusing distances and our exposure settings. And because we had no viewfinder, we had to guess at the direction the camera was pointing. And you can clearly see that even with those handicaps, we were able to take quite usable photographs. You can immediately see that there are no stars in this photograph, even though the stars were very bright during our experiment. They're simply too dim to be registered on film at the exposure levels that we use to take these photographs. The evidence appears to be overwhelming. But still, the skeptics refuse to lie down and roll over. A mysterious rock in a notorious Apollo 16 photograph has only added fuel to the fire. 
it's a rock that obviously was made out of paper mache and very clearly on the rock is the letter C. Ralph René believes the C rock was probably the C prop. Somebody told me that in Hollywood when they do a set, the, stay, the set manager comes around and drops cards on the ground and it says A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, or 1 to 10 or whatever. And the, 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 the prop men, whatever you call these people, they come out and they put that particular prop over the card. But in Hollywood, they're smart enough to turn the thing upside down so you can't see the mark on the, on the prop. NASA simply claims that this photo was a freak accident, that the C is in fact a hair on the negative. But this nitpicking over photographs is irrelevant for magazine publisher Marcus Allen. He's convinced that no photographic film could possibly have survived the journey to the moon and back in the first place. In an unprotected camera, in unprotected environment, and the films that were in photographs we have seen as a result of that, it demonstrate absolutely no radiation damage whatsoever. In 1998, IMAX began production on a film about the construction of the International Space Station. They flew the cameras up in the space shuttle, with their magazines attached, and the IMAX cameras take 70 millimeter roll film, incidentally the same film as was used in the Hasselblad still cameras on Apollo. This film had to be protected, and it was carried up in lead-lined boxes. Radiation may be the final insurmountable obstacle. Not only would it apparently destroy film, it would also kill the astronauts. The Earth's magnetic field shields our planet from high doses of radiation. But beyond this, in space, the conspiracy theorists claim the astronauts' fragile flesh would be bombarded by an arsenal of deadly forces. The moon is irradiated by the sun constantly with terrible heat. And of course, there's cosmic radiation. And then there are micrometeorites that travel 60,000 miles an hour that would go right through the camera, the film, and of course, the astronauts themselves. While the odds against a micrometeoroid hitting an astronaut are believed to be extremely low, any puncture would be decidedly uh, uncomfortable. Not only that, on leaving the Earth's atmosphere, the astronauts had to negotiate the Van Allen belts. Van Allen, he said it was a sea of deadly radiation. You would pick up a death dose just about the time you got through the Van Allen shield, you'd be cooked and you'd be dying. These radioactive belts form a thick invisible ring around the Earth's equator, thinning out around the North and South Poles. Until they get an engine that'll lift the, the life capsule surrounded by six feet of water or equivalent mass of lead, they don't even dare go through the Van Allen shield. In fact, Dr. Van Allen, who's still alive, it makes no secret of the fact that he thinks these stories about killer radiation are silly. Uh, entertaining but preposterous is his words. And the reason is that the radiation levels there are not enough to hurt you unless you stay there for a long time. Uh, Van Allen says about a month. NASA claims the astronauts endured only a very brief exposure, passing through the thinnest parts of the belts in a matter of hours. But once they were through, they faced a still more deadly phenomenon. So here we have these clowns running around in tinfoil craft, stopping solar radiation. And I'm not talking about the light. I'm talking about the radiation from the solar storms. You put a man in a powerful solar flare, he's dead. End of story, he is dead, unless he carries protection. These unpredictable eruptions from the sun can knock out satellites and electricity grids on Earth, but they can be detected by an early warning computer system. When you land on the moon, you're practically standing still, being bombarded with all this solar radiation and smacking into you, uh, which is why they had to hide the whole thing, because it just can't be done. It couldn't be done then, can't be done today, and it sure isn't going to be done in the future when they're planning on this manned mission to Mars. Just three months after the Apollo 16 mission, 
NASA admitted that a violent solar flare did hit the moon's surface. It was powerful enough to have killed the astronauts. Solar flares are one of those things that you have to take a calculated risk on because they will zap you with radiation once, once they get to you, but you've got a long time, hours if not a day or more, to either come back to Earth, find a shielded place, or prepare yourself. The astronauts' only potential shield was their spacecraft. And I had plans for this. The plan was to turn the bulky end of the ship toward the incoming front of radiation. That bulk of the ship and all the fuel in it would provide plenty of protection for that burst of radiation. The conspiracy theorists believe that radiation is the final nail in the coffin, scientific proof that the astronauts could not have survived a trip to the moon and back. But paradoxically, radiation may also offer proof of the counterclaim that we've definitely been to the moon and souvenirs brought back may prove it. In total, the Apollo missions brought back over 382 kilograms of lunar soil and rock samples, which were distributed to laboratories all over the world. At the independent Barclay Geochronology Center in California, geologist Paul René has been studying lunar rock samples for the last 10 years. His main interest is the tiny glass spherules found on the moon's surface, created by the intense heat of a meteorite impact. The spherules uh, that we've been analyzing are tiny balls of, of glass, so they're like magma that we find on the Earth in that sense. But they've, they've cooled very, very quickly, and so they form a essentially uniform glass sphere. With less gravity to distort their shape, lunar spherules are generally larger and rounder than their Earth counterparts, but it's the age that really sets them apart. In this copper disk, we have loaded 145 of these lunar spherules. This copper disk will then be loaded into a sample chamber, which you can see here. By using a laser heating system to release the gases contained in the spherules, Paul René can test them for cosmic radiation, determining their age, and thus the holy grail, their true origin. The uh, lunar materials that we've analyzed and, and that others have analyzed show evidence of having been bombarded by cosmic radiation, uh, and which we don't see on Earth because we have an atmosphere that really shields them uh, very effectively. According to the tests, the spherules are 3.9 billion years old. This immediately rules out any terrestrial origin. The oldest glass I'm aware of on the Earth anywhere is about 165 million years old. So the Earth, with its very dynamic environment, does not tend to preserve these glassy objects, whereas the moon, being essentially dead from a, from a thermal point of view, uh, does tend to preserve these things. The results that we obtained are absolutely definitively proof of a lunar origin. I can say with utmost assurance that, they're, that they were derived from the moon. The conspiracy theorists have heard this sort of thing a thousand times. They're not fooled for a second. Uh, the lunar rocks were fake, just like the pictures were in the stories of the astronauts. Uh, NASA has a ceramics laboratory where it would have been very easy to produce the 800 pounds of rocks allegedly brought back from the moon. But it's evidence the astronauts left behind, not what they brought back, that may finally prove the skeptics wrong. Each mission set up a series of experiments. More than 30 years after the Apollo 11 mission, one of them continues to function, the Lunar Laser Ranger. There were two major experiments. One was a a series of corner reflectors to reflect laser beams from the Earth sent to the moon that then, because of the geometry of these corner reflectors, would send the beam back in exactly the direction that it came from. High up in the Davis mountain range, the McDonald Observatory in Texas still gathers information from those reflectors. 
In 33 years, no, no one has showed up. No one has come and, and talked to us. Jerry Wyant would welcome a visit from the conspiracy theorists. Since 1969, his team has been firing a laser beam at the experiment on average 240 times a year. And of course, at Apollo 11 site is where uh, the United States placed its first lunar retro package. So we, we fire laser at this spot and two others, uh, three others on the moon. Now he's turned the laser on. In a few seconds, you'll see the, the splash. The laser hits the apparatus on the moon's surface and is reflected back as a series of pulses, invisible to the human eye. By measuring the amount of time it takes for each laser pulse to return to Earth, Jerry and the team can gather exact information about the Earth's position in the solar system. That's not light coming from the moon. The splash you see is, is light coming from uh, the end of our own telescope. That's the first spot where a man walked on the moon. It's a tough one to refute. And perhaps unsurprisingly, the conspiracy theorists tend to grow reticent when the subject of laser reflectors crops up. And so it's sad that uh, the detractors have never taken the time to, to ask the people who are actually involved. They just make up their mind that it's a hoax and never bother to ask us. During the Cold War, both the Soviet Union and East Germany had agents in place to spy on the Apollo program. If there had been a hoax, they would have noticed, but the conspiracy theorists have conveniently ignored their listening powers. Why don't they ask the Russians? The Russians were in direct competition with us, and if they, if the Russians suspected in any way that we were faking anything, they'd have, they'd have broadcast that all over the world. Every time we go to a new frontier, further out, people will tell stories and other people will wrap them in myth. And the hoax theory is a compelling myth. Like explorers proving the Earth to be round, not flat, it seems as if all great achievements will always attract disbelief and controversy. In a million years of human history, going to the moon, baying for the moon, wishing for the moon was a metaphor for the impossible. And suddenly people did it. But I think a large part of it is just cultural vandalism. <laughs> cultural vandal, I like it. <laughs> I think I'm going to get a sign for my car. I am a cultural head, though. That's a good one. Yeah, like uh, the urge to deface the Mona Lisa or to carve your initials into a, into a statue, to carve your initials onto the face of the Apollo program is just an urge that people seem to have, some people. Perhaps the final proof is this. Compared to difficulties involved in sustaining such an elaborate scam, wouldn't it be so much easier to build a rocket and fly to the moon?